Hello, I'm Dr. Marty Martin, and I'm a faculty member at DePaul University in Chicago. What we're going to focus on today is infectious disease epidemiology. That's a mouthful, infectious disease epidemiology. By the end of this short presentation, you'll have a sense of what that means, not only for you perhaps as an individual, but also as a healthcare manager or epidemiologist or someone that's working in big data, which is the field about predictive analytics. So let me first begin by sharing with you a story. Most of you, I'm sure, have gone to the dentist. And when you go to the dentist, maybe you have a little bit of pain, or maybe you're like some of those individuals that are really good in terms of prevention, and you want to make sure that you prevent any cavities by getting a regular routine cleaning, which typically happens once every six months. So if you'll notice here, on the slide, you'll see the gum line, which you'll also notice is a pocket. So some of you may be recognizing that as gingivitis or gum disease, and it is. Now, how does gum disease develop? It develops through a bacteria, which is an infection. So you know you're supposed to floss twice a day, and you're supposed to brush, and brush for about two minutes, and brush in a certain way, as well as perhaps gargle with a reticular fluid, if you will, that may be made by Listerine that has some antibacterial properties. Because what happens in our body, and I'm just using our teeth and gums as an example, is that our gum tissue becomes a host. And it becomes a host for the bacteria to take root and grow and flourish. So they find a nice comfy spot in your gums. And if that happens over the course of time, what happens is they'll begin to eat away at the gums, and then you'll have bleeding of the gums. Your gums will recede in some pain. So that's largely preventable. So you go to the dentist. So when you go to the dentist, you're hoping to get things fixed or really get your mouth in such a shape that you're not as immune, if you will, to having bacterial infection. So the dentist has instruments. You have to ask yourself the question, are those instruments clean and sterile? Because you may go into the dental office without an infection and later come out with an infection that was caused by what? Unclean instruments. Also, too, it kind of freaks me out a little bit, but when you go to the dentist, they have the face shield and they have the gloves and they have the gown, but most patients do not. So you're kind of wondering is, do they think I have something that's communicable? No, they're protecting themselves and they're protecting you because you can get a disease from instruments. You can also get a disease from other persons. And a bit later, we'll talk about transmission of disease. And then finally, you have to think about the interaction between people. So just simply going to the dental visit, you can take a look at the practical aspects of infectious disease. So what is an infectious disease? In essence, what it is is it is an organism, which is the agent, is the term that's used, and it's introduced into a host. So for the sake of human health and disease, the host is a human being but it has to be a, an optimal environment. So that optimal environment may be t uh, temperature, it may be humidity. So when you really think about an infectious disease, you have what's called the host agent environment triad or triangle, which I'll share with you right now. So with that particular triad, what you will note is the host in our cases is a human being. More specifically, it could be your gum, could be your liver, could be your heart, so there may be an organ that's involved, could be your skin. Now the agents can range from bacteria to influenza to parasites to even chemical toxins, nuclear toxins. Those are all different types of agents. Now the environment is temperature, humidity, and other factors. Now if any of you are watching kind of from the Chicago area, you know that during the summer, that if it's pretty rainy, people get scared about West Nile virus. And the newscasters will tell you is, please make sure that you have no standing water. If you have old tires, make sure there's no water in them. Why? Because the mosquitoes love that environment. So the mosquitoes breed in those old tires with water. So then what happens is they're pretty populated. So now what the mosquitoes do is they look for the host, which is you and then the mosquito comes and bites you, and then as the mosquito bites you and sucks your blood, if you will, so that way they get nourishment, what they also leave you with is the West Nile virus. 
So that's a good example of understanding the epidemiologic triad or triangle. But why should you really care about infectious diseases? And if you'll note in this chart is that the beginning of time, if you really go back, most of us died from infectious diseases. Could have been rubella, could have been all types of diseases. But what they have done over time is they've decreased. So most of us now are dying from chronic lifestyle related diseases. Diabetes, hypertension, cancer, not so much from infectious diseases. But don't fool yourself. Infectious diseases are trending down, but they haven't disappeared. Think about HIV AIDS. It's no longer the death sentence that it used to be, but it still exists. And one of the interesting facts about it is it's really rising in the aging population. We tend to have thought of it as a young person's disease, but that's no longer the case. I just mentioned West Nile virus. So when you really think about the importance of making sure that you both examine and control infectious diseases, it's important from a community perspective. But for those of you that are healthcare managers or aspiring healthcare managers, you have to think about something that's called HAIs, or hospital acquired infections. It could also include dental settings as well. So the federal government right now is making sure and has passed some legislation such that if you acquire a HAI or hospital acquired infection, that you will not have to pay for the treatment of that if your insurance is covered by Medicare. So increasingly what's happening among hospital administrators and other administrators is they want to make sure that they reduce the incidence and prevalence of HAIs because it makes good financial sense and public health sense. I want you to watch this video about Jenny. And what Jenny will describe in this video is her story. Jenny was okay, she had to go to the hospital, but she contracted an HAI. So not only is this an important matter as it relates to reimbursement and to quality of care and patient safety, but it has a human element. So when you're thinking about infectious disease epidemiology, don't look at this as purely an academic exercise. It has an impact on people's lives, like Jenny. So, how are disease transmitted? Fundamentally in two ways. One way is you have direct transmission. So that direct transmission, go back to the West Nile virus. So there you would have the mosquito, so the mosquito would land on your skin, would bite you, take your blood for nourishment, and also uh, transmit the West Nile virus. So that's directly. Other ways is indirect transmission. So one way is a doorknob. And if you notice kind of bathroom behavior, so you go to the bathroom and then you wash your hands. So after you've washed your hands, then if you still have to turn off the water, how do you do that? So do you then touch the water faucet? So now perhaps you're reinfecting yourself. But if it's an automatic, you just stick your hands underneath, water comes, no problem. And then you go to the door. So when you go to the door and if you have to pull it, then you're thinking, okay, what do I do? Do I reinfect myself? Because somebody just came through. Or do you get a paper towel, put the paper towel on, and just dump it? So you have, and those are called fomites. So a good example of a doorknob or maybe a table or pencil or money or menus, those are all fomites. So those are things, you know, environmental stimuli, if you will, that enable you perhaps to catch a particular infectious agent. The other is a sneeze. So you never really think about this until maybe you're on the L or you're on Metra or you're on a subway or you're on an airplane or in a car with someone. And say for example, someone's sitting right next to you on a bus or on the subway and their face is this way but they sneeze. And you think you feel some particles here. You hope you don't but, but you kind of say, oop, feel particles. So perhaps you could be infected. So now what people are doing with regard to coughing, people used to cover their mouths like this. <coughs> so increasingly people are going like that. So as a way to kind of reduce the spread, if you will. And that next image is an image of a tick. So if you notice the tick is lodged in the skin of an individual. So if you think about Lyme disease. So these are all different ways that people can become infected directly and indirectly. So let's talk a little bit about airborne infections. Now you'll remember a number of years ago about the SARS outbreak. 
So people were very concerned about, should I get it on an airplane or not? And in fact, I have a diagram for you that shows you kind of a replica of the ex actual airplane. The individual with the X mark, that's what epidemiologists call the index case. So that's the individual with the SARS. And if you will note, all those little kind of red boxes there, those are individuals that later showed symptoms of SARS. So they contracted SARS. So what's amazing about this is the closer the individuals were to that index case, the more likely they were to contract SARS. If you go to the very back of the plane or go to the front of the plane, not as many cases. So proximity makes a big difference as it relates to airborne infections. So how can infections, diseases, be curtailed in healthcare settings? There are a couple rules. The first one is common sense, wash hands. But in a lot of cases, that doesn't happen as much as it should. So I think it's incumbent upon you as a uh, patient is to make sure that healthcare providers wash their hands. The other is follow financial incentives. Because as I indicated, uh, CMS, which governs Medicare reimbursement, they're saying, you know what, hospitals and other health care facilities will no longer pay you if you have to treat someone that contracts an HAI, like Jenny, in your facility. And take personal responsibility if you're sick. I know the winter's going to come up shortly, and I may have a cold or a flu. So if I have a cold or a flu, which is communicable, so I can possibly infect someone else, what do I do? Do I try to be the good trooper, the good corporate citizen, and come in uh, sneezing and coughing? Or do I take concern for the health of others and stay home until I'm fully healthy and then return? Because don't fool yourself. You may come in and be a good corporate citizen, but you're infecting others. And if those others then become sick and they become absent, then you've really created a problem that is preventable. The other is if you're a manager or you're a team leader, hold other accountable for making sure they stay home if they're sick. They can still be productive, but what you don't want to have happen is them come in as a good corporate citizen and infect others, and you'll really lower your productivity. And if you work in a healthcare facility, be it a nursing home, dental clinic, medical group, or hospital, make it part of your safety culture to make sure is that one of the things we do around here even when we're extremely busy and extremely stressed, is to wash our hands. So hopefully you have a good overview about what infectious disease epidemiology is and the importance of it in our society, in healthcare organizations, and for patients like Jenny.